like I told Tim a moment ago, um, that I went back and looked it up when we had the Extension Master Gardener Coordinator Conference um, in Madison, Wisconsin. That one was graciously hosted by Mike Maddox. And Tim gave a presentation at that meeting that just really stuck in my head. And all these years later, I still think about what he talked about with him and his team and the strategic plans and the language that we use to promote extension within the community. So um, Tim and his team have done a fantastic job with thinking through mission statements and it's not an easy process and considering the language that we use that we use and so I think all of us will benefit today from identifying some red flags and potentially considering how we can update change or improve our existing communication strategies so Tim is joining us today from Minnesota extension and Tim you're also um, with the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, correct? Could you tell uh, the, us a little bit about your role? Sure. Hey, Nicole. Hey there. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the invite. I can't believe it's been three years since Madison, right? Oh my gosh. As much as the last year has been so challenging, time's been dragging sometimes. But it just, but still, three years. Wow. Uh, it was great to see everybody. Um, yeah. The um, my role is is. Uh, both with extension with the Master Gardener program and also with the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, which is just outside of Minneapolis, a 1200 acre horticulture public garden, where I serve as a director of education. And I've been there for just about, about 30 years, real close to 30 years um, at the Arboretum. So should I just, should we just jump in and keep going, Nicole, or do you wanna? Yes, we can, we can jump in. I'm gonna do, two things, I'm managing the chat and still letting people in. Um, and then I also want to let folks know if you have questions, feel free to type your questions in the chat box. And Tim has time at the end of the presentation where we can address um, your comments or questions and go through those. Uh, this is meant to be a discussion. So I think that everyone will take away some great advice and information and tips today. Um, so please share with us at the end uh, any questions you might have or what you plan to do with this information. Uh, so Tim, if you want to let me know when you're ready to advance the slides, I can do that for you. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks for your help, Nicole. You're if welcome. We can go ahead and jump to the, yeah, there we go. Um, so again, thanks for the invite to see everyone today. I'm joining you from my uh, non-office from the University of Minnesota. We're still not back in our offices, so joining you from the, the a spare bedroom, right? Oh my goodness. Uh, it's, uh, I've been here for over a year as some of you have been in your places too, I'm sure. So I think I want to start out a little bit with um, just making a note that the information, information I'm sharing with you today is really meant to be as, as a case study, right? About what things that have been going on in Minnesota and I, with the intent that perhaps there's some things you can take away for your toolkit that you might want to model something after, or perhaps the opposite. Perhaps you'll hear me say something that you think, oh my gosh, we'll never do that. That's good too, right? Things that you might want to do or things that you know definitely don't want to do. So whatever takeaway for you, that's the spirit of sharing this case study with you. So um, I'll just jump back in time to 2015 for a moment. And um, that's when, uh, my job at the Arboretum um, changed a little bit and, and included um, the uh, Master Gardener Program for the state of Minnesota um, in the role of director. And it was a time we extension really intentionally changed the, the organizational chart for the Master Gardener Program. Uh, it changed from a two person, two FTEs, a program director, the store date right director of the program, and a program leader. So there were two, a team of two. And in 2015, it changed to a team of five with the full-time equivalence of 3.7. So what that means is there's five people on this, what we call a state leadership team for the Master Gardener program in Minnesota, but different percent times. You know how that goes with universities, right? So for thinking about myself, this is, 25% uh, of my job is the statewide director and there's um, uh, other people on the team and some of them are here today. So I gotta say hello to some of the other members of our leadership team. 
I think I saw that Jackie signed in. Jackie, you here? Hello, everyone. Yeah, this is Jackie. All right, great to see you, Jackie. And I think Christy's here too. Hello. Hi, Christy. Who else might be here? Hey, Delisha, are you on the call by chance? I am. Hello, everyone. Hey, Delisha. <laughs> And how, and how about Diane? Maybe Diane's even joining us today. Diane, are you possibly here? All right. So that's the, that's the program in Minnesota. That's the leadership team. And we really approach all this work as a team. So what happened in 2015? First thing, you know, new person on the job, right? The first question I asked was, so where's, what's the strategic plan look like for the Master Gardener program in Minnesota? And the answer that I got was, well, we don't have one. And I'm so used to working with strategic planning, right, in my, in my job at the Arboretum. So that was the first thing to do was to create a strategic plan. And, you know, the thing that we did to do that was we really, you know, started really simple and just documented where the program was at the time without any future planning, just created a document talking to different stakeholders. So what, what do we do? Who do we, you know, who do, who do we serve? How do we do our work? What's this program about? We just documented it all into about a 12 or 13 page document, you know, and broke it into buckets of things and, um, and just created a plan as a starting point. So just a documentation of what was going on. And then the first piece we decided to tackle from a strategic plan point of view was what content will we work on um, as a team? What's our content? So next slide, please. So in, in order to focus on the content for, the st for strategic planning, the first thing we did was we want to find out like what are people interested regarding plants in their lives? So we did a electronic survey of all volunteers in the state. And those questions were about, you know, what are you hearing from your audiences? What questions are people asking you? Um, it was a great source of information, right? Over 2000 volunteers and saying, what are you hearing? What do people want to know? And we talked to extension educators and got an in-person, like a focus group together. So, and wonder what they were hearing from their audiences. Also local coordinators throughout the state. And then the Arboretum education team. The Arboretum education team is a team of about 30 people serving um, horticulture information from pre-kindergarten through adults. So we just looked at all of these stakeholder groups and said, what are people wanting to learn about plants? What are the hot topics? So next slide. So we took that information and made one of these wordles, right? And this is what we found out. Not terribly surprising. And you know, you can see pollinators, integrated pest management, disease diagnostics, you can see the words. These are the things that came out of that, all those, all that input and stakeholders and surveys, stakeholder analysis and surveys. So the next step we took was to take all this information and the next slide. We turn that into the priorities for the Master Gardener program for Minnesota and came up with the seven priority areas. And that drives our work to this day. Um, horticulture skills, plant biodiversity, pollinators, clean water, local food, climate change, and nearby nature. So those became our program priorities. And we determined those by asking our stakeholder groups what people were interested in. So we really feel it, it was definitely an audience driven process um, that helped us determine what our priorities should be at our state level. So next slide, please. So we the content really matters, of course, so we did that. But then who's it for? Right? Who, who is, what is our program for? Who is this content for? And how do people want to learn about their interest in plants? And we really, really decided we really need to meet people where they are, wherever they are in their plant learning journey, right? Whether they know nothing about plants or are really already involved and how do we cast a really wide net? 
So next slide. So we took a look at this from a point of view of a what we call the horticulture continuum of learning. And this is really a lot of words on this page, but what it is is simply a, a continuum of where people are in their horticulture knowledge. So way at the left side is someone who's really not interested maybe in plants or it's just not been a thing that they've worked that they've been interested in before, right? So for those folks, we might want to have things about awareness. You know, sometimes awareness is something like a as simple as a button that someone wears on their on their shirt or on their backpack, right? Just a button about I love plants or whatever it is, right? Some kind of an awareness thing. Or, or maybe it's a coffee mug or a sticker or something like that, an awareness thing. And as you move across this continuum, people have more and more prior knowledge about horticulture. So programs we develop and activities we design meet people where they are along the continuum. And one thing I noticed when we started looking at this continuum, thinking about the Master Gardener program, is that kind of where I put that circle on this slide, most of the information that was happening in the state that Master Gardeners were sharing with the public was somewhere with, loosely within that circle. So we were really serving pretty well people who already had an interest in gardening and growing plants. And they might be interested in growing that further, but we really weren't, there really wasn't much going on on the awareness end. It was more about engaging people that were already engaged. And that was just a thing that we found out when we looked at what kind of, what kind of activities and programs were we doing on a statewide level. That's who we were reaching. So if we wanted to change that, right, and start talking about who we serve, we, uh, next slide. We started to do some strategic planning around that and realized that language really matters, the language that we were using in our program. So we went out and did another round of input from stakeholders and developed another and developed, a, you know, move beyond the documentation of that first strategic plan that we did to develop a more forward looking strategic plan. So a new round of input from stakeholders and did a draft plan and distributed that out to stakeholders, made some changes and put the final plan in place. And look at that 2022. Now that's right around the corner. Uh oh, I'll get into that in a minute. So that's that's coming up. Uh, next slide, please. So when we were looking at the strategic plan, we realized in the 2014 version, which was that documentation version, right? 2014 and 15, the buckets we put things in, the whole plan was around how employees saw the program. So it was things like program structure was one section and volunteer services was another section and education was another one. And so all of these things, you know, the titles for the chunks of this plan made sense from an employee point of view and a leadership point of view, but not maybe so much to our audiences. It was certainly it was an okay way to organize it, but it was really employee centric. So if we go to the next slide, you can see how in for 2018, we really changed, we changed the names of these the areas of our strategic plan to be volunteer and community focused language. So now the areas of the strategic plan, volunteer recruitment, volunteer support, volunteer development, we really intentionally put the word volunteer in front of each of those three areas to make it volunteer facing and about volunteers, not about staff. Um, we also have a section on impacts and public value. That's about what does our program do? Again, it's not staff focused, it's outward focused about impacts. And then the, the last two sections, coordinator, leader support and development and program leadership and management, those are more internal, but we put them at the bottom of the list on purpose because they're, they are more internally focused. So that was our, one of our first steps about language and changing how we frame things. So next slide, please. 
So this was the mission. This is our mission in 2014, 2015. And I'll just pause for a moment so you can read the, if you can go, just go take a minute and read what the mission was. Okay, so next slide, let's jump, go to the next slide and a few red flags, thinking about how we're changing or working on the language of our program and, you know, back to that continuum of learning, if we're going to expand who we reach. So one of the red flags that first appeared to us was that the goal of volunteers, it says the mission here is to support extension. So again, it was focused inward, right? Or for if the whole goal is to support extension by providing volunteers. So one way to look at it, next slide, please. So the next red flag is to educate the public with research-based information on best practices. Like we're doing something to someone is another way to read that. Um, so, in the next slide, this is a, a, of course, a sarcastic interpretation of that mission of the 2014 mission. Join us, serve extension, and tell your neighbors how they should be doing things. That's kind of a you could see it that way, you know, from an external point of view. We knew what we knew what that 2014 meant internally, but externally, it certainly could be taken this way or perceived this way. So. Let's take a look again at the four, oh, sorry, next slide. So that was, that's again, that's a 2014 one that we just read. And the, the next slide is the 2018. Let's take a look at that. So after many renditions and much feedback, this is where we landed on our 2018 mission in an attempt to um, make it more outward focused and change our language, um, reach more people, be more inclusive and change the mission to be about impact and less about internal structures. So next slide, please. I think there's still a red flag in our 2018 mission and it's that word deliver and i'm going to come back to that later in this in this presentation we're starting to look at that now at our next strategic plan rendition is wondering about delivering educational outreach um, thinking about the word in engagement and community engagement instead of delivering things um, next slide please we also developed a, a vision. So I'll just pause where you can read the vision of our program. Next slide, please. I don't, we don't, we're not sure yet if this is a red flag or not, but it's something we're thinking about. Is it our vision that volunteers be respected? Uh, valued, absolutely, right? But I, I'm not, I don't know, we're, we're working on that one. We're not, we're not sure about that language yet. We need to think of it right from how it might be perceived um, outside of our organization. So next slide. The other thing we took some time in doing is the program didn't really didn't have a set of guiding principles. So principles that guide the work. Um, and these are the five that we that we landed on. We will certainly be revisiting in our next strategic planning um, how the if these still hold up, right? If we're still happy with them or if they're still serving what we need them to do. But and there's details you, you can read um, later, but this the top line is we're connected to the University of Minnesota, we're connected to people. We're connected to our communities. We're connected to our earth. And through all, we strive to be accessible and welcoming to all. Those are our main guiding principles. And these are the things that we hold up to when we're developing a new program or developing a new education 
a new education piece. We look to these guiding principles and say, are we doing it? Are we, are we holding these guiding principles um, in our work? Something to hold your work up to, right? To see if we're still on track with where we thought we should be as part of our strategic plan. So next slide, please. And boy, that's really tiny, isn't it? Who can see that? Anyway, what we've got is the, these are the guiding principles and our priorities and our mission and vision on one page. And we wanted this all on a one page document. And then the next slide is the entire strategic plan from 2018 on one page. So it's all six buckets or, or areas, if you will, of our strategic plan and the bullets underneath and the strategic plan 2018 to 22. Again, this is what guides our work. And we chose to take the path for this strategic plan of not including action items. So it's not a working plan. It's simply a strategic plan and a guiding document and the action items or the work that we do, they certainly fall into these areas, but the work is not spelled out in our strategic plan. Um, that comes later, but this is just a, so a strategic plan, a true plan to guide our, our direction. So let's take a look at putting the strategic plan and putting some of these language things into real life. What did we do with some of this stuff as we looked at some of our programs and activities? So the next slide. So we started looking at some of the things, remember back to that continuum of learning, like the awareness and wanting to increase our audience reach to different, all different types of people. So some changes that we made, we changed the ask a master gardener um, signs, right? About you set up a table and it says, ask a master gardener. We changed that to let's talk plants. So our idea here was to make it invitational for a conversation. So even if someone didn't have a question, they could walk up to a table and say, well, hello, Master Gardeners, <laughs> right? And have, let's talk about plants. And it, it gives us a platform to just have a conversation with folks, even if someone doesn't have a question. Kind of tried to lower the risk a little bit of just of having a conversation. Another example is, so for example, if we have a title of a program called Planting for Pollinators in Your Yard and Garden. Um, and we changed that to Helping Pollinators Thrive. And one of the main things we were working on there is to take out the word yard and garden. We felt that that's, back to that continuum of learning again, that's people with prior knowledge, right? Someone who owns a home, has a yard, has a garden, and we're, I th we felt like we were limiting our information to that subgroup of people where helping pollinators thrive is a much wider, we feel like a wider net and wider invitation to engaging with people that are interested in pollinators, but maybe don't have a yard or garden. Um, so it's a it's not a don't serve people with yards and gardens, it's, it, it's both. But how do we also reach out with our language to folks that, that are interested in helping pollinators thrive? Another example was we had a publication called Backyard Vegetables. And when we started looking at this, you know, at our, at our language, we thought, well, what, what if someone doesn't have a backyard? What if they wanna grow vegetables on a deck or perhaps in a community plot or at the local place of worship or the school or whatever it is, what if it's not, right? So how about vegetables for everyone? Um, and so let's take a look at the next, slide. This is how these things look visually. So the Ask a Master Gardener turned into Let's Talk Plants. And that little circle that Let's Talk Plants, that's also made into a button. And there's also like a bookmark that says Learn, Connect, Share, Act, Let's Talk Plants. So it also became, you know, a visual brand. So you could, you know, wear a button that says Let's Talk Plants. You can we put a, a pile of those buttons out a couple of times and people just walked up to the table and said, can I have one of those? Can I have a let's talk plants button? So, well, sure. And they put it and put it on their shirt and, and walk away. Um, so ask a master gardener to let's talk plants. Uh, next slide. So this is the toolkit um, for master gardener, for master gardener learning. And instead of growing vegetables in your yard, it's vegetables for everyone. So it's simply a title change. Um, and of course it, it does pertain to some of the content too, of course, we're 
more inclusive about how people are growing food and where they're growing food. Uh, next slide, please. So instead of a, this brochure was renamed Planting for Pollinators in Your Yard, the brochure was renamed, um, here's how you can help pollinators thrive. So we, we, again, wanted to use language that anyone who wants to help pollinators thrive can feel engaged uh, in our work. And so, and inside the, you can see it's a, it's a uh, fourfold brochure with information inside. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the title of a children's garden program that we have. And it's called Children's Garden in Residence. Just another um, use of language that, and when, the, when Minnesota Master Gardeners work with children in children's gardens, we do it in partnership and in collaboration with other organizations. Um, we're always the guest, uh, working with youth serving agencies. And this language just reflects that we're in residence. So you can read that as we're here to help. Um, we're here to help you with your goals and objectives and bring the garden piece with us to you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's some background about 2015 to 2018. So language changes we went through, some strategic planning we went through and language changes with that. So I thought I would share with you so what's next? So Nicole, we haven't, you haven't seen these yet, right? Unless you looked ahead because I sent you this earlier today. So, but what's next? We're still on this journey, right? We're still on this journey of, of working on our program. So let's take a look at the next slide. So we think language still matters and thinking about what other changes might be um, in store for us based on our new mission and guiding principles. So, and I think some of you might be aware of this. I'll just do a quick review. Um, we've engaged with a local consultant uh, here in Minnesota. Um, it's about an eight month journey so far with a local consultant to help us with um, surveys of looking for barriers for, to participation in our program. Are there barriers that exist? It's a pretty wide open statement, right? Are there barriers that exist to participating either as a Master Gardener volunteer or participating in one of our programs? Are there perceived barriers? So what, they done, what they've done for us is they've, they did a, a set of key informant interviews um, specifically with BIPOC community leaders and garden leaders um, in Minnesota. And those key informant interviews, each one was about an hour long that their consultant did and asked questions about our program and how it's perceived in communities. And then we also did a large survey of all our master gardeners um, asking questions, what they might have heard or what they know about barriers to participation in our program. And when we get this, we hope to have the final report from the consulting firm in the next 30 days or so. And from that report, we'll be developing new pieces of our next strategic plan based on that information that we receive from the consultant about how our program is perceived. So that's just an update about a process that we're going through. And I look forward to sharing that with you further when we, when we finish that up and get the information from the consultant and then turn it into action items and strategic plan in our next strategic plan. Uh, next slide, please. Well, remember I was saying, I think there's a flag here, right? It's still a flag about this delivering educational outreach. And um, we are starting to work on this one. I think we'll, we'll change the name, we'll change that deliver for sure. And, but what, what do we change it to? That's something we're working on. And uh, next slide, please. And one of the reasons that's important to us is because if you remember our guiding principles, that middle one, we're connected to our communities. And if you go on to read, it says, and their needs drive the work of our program. And 
who are empowered to create change in our communities through educational engagement in alignment with our program priorities. So we're taking a close look at that piece and how does that relate to us delivering programs and thinking about the word engagement. So now the next piece of our work is to think about, so what, what counts? What are we doing with our program? Think, keeping to think about language, but also thinking about what do we actually do? What's the volunteer work and what are we doing and how are we engaging? So next slide. So here are the questions that we're asking ourselves. So what counts and what counts both in for impact, right? What's our impact of our program and what counts for volunteer hours? That word counts has a dual meaning here. Um, and our first question is historically in Minnesota, generally speaking, uh, county groups decide what programs to do, which of course, right? That's been the way it's been for, for quite some time. And we'll continue that, of course. But we're also asking the question of, yes, county groups decide what programs to do. But also, what about co-creating programs with local audiences? What if it's something that that local group didn't think of or doesn't even doesn't think to do? And one way to get at that, and this is the same kind of thing, but a different a different angle to look at it is, Often our recruiting efforts historically have been recruiting master gardeners to help us do our programs. You know, we might put out a list of, like at the county level, might put out a list. These are the pro these, these are the things that we do as master gardeners in a county, and then invite people to join us to do those things. And we're starting to wonder that yes, we'll certainly do that, but so it's the yes and how can we learn from new master gardeners, how to engage with their community, however they define that, their neighborhood, their church, their school, their friends, about plants and gardens. And how can we support those new initiatives as a result? So we're starting to dream about things like, let's say we're reaching out um, in, in Minnesota, there's a, um, a Somali uh, immigrant community. And so if we reach out to a local community like a Somali community and say, what's interesting to you about plants? And how might we help you serve some things that you want to do? How can we welcome you to our program and focus on your goals and objectives, but not ours? And how can we include you in our program? Those are some of the things we're asking and thinking about how we can um, how it can both do that, but also model and create ways to share with counties throughout the state and encourage folks to do that. Um, next slide, please. Another piece we're working on is, and this has been changing over time, but if, if I go back about, I'm going to say probably 50, between 10 and 15 years in Minnesota, there was the you know, if, if a volunteer wanted to do work that counts for hours toward their hourly, yearly commitment, they were invited, encouraged to share information about gardening with people, but you couldn't count any gardening labor. That was the Minnesota rule. You, you, you can't literally do any gardening. And um, we are um, we changed that a couple of years ago, but we're continuing to prioritize a move away from discouraging gardening to encouraging gardening um, with master gardeners and community um, and working side by side and hand by hand with community members um, and doing things like creating and maintaining model gardens with walk by learning and giving gardens, uh, plant giveaways, and places like conversations, I call them conversations over the backyard fence. You know, when, when I'm, I'm sure if you're a master gardener coordinator and you tell your friends that and people find out, 
I mean, how often in a social gathering does someone say, say, I've got a plant question for you. You know, you know how that happens. Um, the same thing happens to master gardeners, right? And um, at least historically in Minnesota, um, years ago, that was, you know, the rule was you can't count that for hours. We're also working on how do we undo that? Because, you know, people trust their neighbors, people trust their friends. And people share information in so many different ways today with Facebook and Instagram and social media. How can we make sure that those things are also quote count as volunteer activities? Um, and I'm, we're not sure how we're going to do that yet, but we're working on it. We want to explore that. And how can we formalize and prioritize a continued move toward that, that short list of things? Um, about what counts as volunteer activities. Um, and the next slide. Oh my gosh, it looks just like the first slide. And that means that's the end of the slides. So that that's kind of a snapshot. That's the, a, a reshare of some stuff from Madison and also about where we're going. And I know some of that last stuff about where we're going. Those are some open-ended questions, right? It's what we're working on. And we'll go into our next strategic plan, which our, our goal for that is to get that done in January. So we're, we're just getting onto it now and we will um, start getting that ready for January of 22 for our next strategic plan. With that, uh, Questions, comments, discussion, take it away, Nicole. Yes, I would love to hear some discussion because I can't imagine that Minnesota is the only state that's asking these questions and making these changes. Um, so I do see a comment from Sharon in the ch chat box and Sharon says that uh, they attempt to turn any request for gardening labor into a public education workshop. And that's a great strategy to get people involved and teach people, but still be able to meet the request in some way. Uh, so I thank you for putting that in there. Um, I want to comment back at the very beginning. Let me see if I can find the slide on your priorities that you all established. Um, I'll pull this up. All right. So from this slide, I think this is great because anyone can read this and understand what the priorities are. Um, so many times in extension, uh, I have some master gardener volunteers that help me with reports or, you know, writing impact statements or success stories. And sometimes I have to give them some background education on how to write an extension. Um, and really what we're writing should be able to be interpreted by anyone who's reading it. It should be easy to understand. And I think you all did a fantastic job with highlighting your top priorities in simple language that anyone can understand whether they're a part of extension or not. And it also helps guide programs because I can see that if you have this as a guiding document, you know, you can figure out where things are aligned with what you're trying to do and where you see yourself in the future. So I'm going to take this and think about the key strategies that we do in our local program. Um, but I think that on this document, you guys did a great job with wording it in a way that anyone can understand your top priorities. Um, if anyone else has comments or, you know, wants to discuss what you're doing in your state or any changes that you made, feel free to unmute yourself, turn on your video or add in the chat box. I do see a question from Wendy Wilbur, who's my state coordinator in Florida. So Tim, Wendy is asking, when did you involve administration in the process? Um, thinking about the, when do you think about strategic planning process or all the way, any specific thing or just all the way along? Yes, in the um, strategic planning process, which I've already floated this with our admin, but I was wondering in the listening groups or the volunteer groups, the focus groups that you did, did you pull in any um, administrators or other, so that's one question. And the other is, did you pull in any other extension agents that weren't necessarily associated with the Master Gardener Volunteer Program? Yeah, those are great, great questions, Wendy. Um, yes, on the administrative piece. Um, I work closely with uh, associate, uh, the way our university is organized. It's a so associate dean um, in College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, and um, in extension 
um, that I work closely with. And um, I kept him aware all the way along and also a, form, a couple formal check-ins along the way, right? Well, here's what we're doing. And do you have any input or comments, concerns, or flags um, at, at strategic points along the way? You know, before anything is like, for example, even the priority slide that you see right now that's up before before that turned into a um, a piece that we distributed widely throughout the state, uh, it went over to extension administration, uh, mostly as an awareness thing, but always, you know, anytime I do that, I'll, I'll say, you know, do you see any red flags from your point of view? Because often, you know, someone sees something from a different level, right? Might say, oh, don't use that word <laughs> because it has something, you know, that I wouldn't know about, some kind of baggage to it, right? Or something. So um, absolutely, I'd absolutely do that. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other piece, Wendy? Great, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, pulling in, um, when I know you pulled Master Gardener volunteer coordinators and the um, people working in, in that section, but did you pull other extension agents that weren't necessarily horticulture related from Minnesota? Are you thinking about for this content piece, like the slide we're looking at right now? No, for your oh. uh, listening groups during the beginning of the strategic plan. Got it. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, extension communications was involved. There's a communication team. That's the team that does here in Minnesota, uh, like the, the web person and uh, uh, public relations communication. So that team takes a look at stuff for us. Again, kind of to do that check to see if there's anything that that might be, even if unintentional, right? We use some language unintentionally that might be, um, we don't know that it, it might be inflammatory or say something that has another meaning to someone else. Um, so we work with that communication team in extension. They're, it's really helpful for us to go with that step. Sure, thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Tim. Absolutely. Okay, Tim, Dennis Patton has asked, can we use your mission statement or is it trademarked? And oh. I'll see if I can find the mission statement. That was the old one. <laughs> So what do you think about people using your mission statement? Oh, please. Yeah, go to the 2018 one. One more slide. OK. Let me get that. Hang on just a moment. There you go. There it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, please. Um, or grab the pieces that sound right for you, right? Or, or change things a little bit to make it fit your. And ideally, you know, at, in the Arboretum side of my work, we have another set of you know, mission and vision and guiding principles for the education department at the Arboretum. And we revisit, revisit those every four to five years just to make sure the language is still relevant and the words are just right. Because again, words can change meaning over time. And um, so I think it's important to revisit it. So we'll, we're doing that too, but please, yeah, make it your own. Grab, grab, grab whatever's helpful, make it your own. And Christy, can you unmute and say what you just shared? Did you just share a direct link to the mission vision guiding? Yeah, so that handout that you had mentioned during your presentation that was too small to see, yeah. I shared the link to that. So if you'd like that as a PDF, that should um, pop up with all of that information there. Thank you, Christy, that's perfect. It is really too small to see on the slide. It's just like a reference thing, but, and there you'll see language for, um, for all, all the language that we're using. Um, and again, we'll have a new one in 2022, but um, where we go in and, and do that same kind of a look through everything and look for uh, potential changes. But please think of it all as, as it's all extension um, material. So um, yes. So I have a, another comment. I really appreciate it. I think it was on your strategic plan in 2018 when you flipped uh, some of the priorities there and you talked about the volunteer recruitment and support at the top and volunteer development. That means a lot to me just personally because I feel that our volunteers are very important to extension, but I also feel volunteers are important because they help form those connections with their neighborhoods and the community. And oftentimes the volunteer aspect is sort of an add-on to a horticulture position or another job when I personally see it as a lot of relationship building. So 
it just means a lot to me to know that Minnesota and your team has kind of flipped this to where instead of what can volunteers do for us, what are we doing for volunteers as well? So I just personally wanted to share that, that I appreciate that. Um, I do see a comment in the chat. Uh, from Leanne, and Leanne says the survey and research work is so important in doing this great work. We surveyed the guiding values of our MGs last summer and learned that fun is an important guiding value for us. Wow, imagine that, having fun again. <laughs> that's wonderful. So yeah, that's some homework for everyone. Increase uh, the amount of fun in your day and in your volunteer programs. That's great advice. How cool that your volunteers identified that. That's very good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know for us, we do a lot of continuing education field trips, and sometimes they're just fun, like a picnic at a park or um, visiting a local garden, and those days are really wonderful. We, we enjoy those. Um, okay, so any other comments or discussion questions? Uh, and Dennis just shared a comment. Thank you, as we have not under updated for years, and this is so much cleaner and focused. Um, so he's talking about the mission statement and appreciates you sharing that. Yes, I have a, a, just a comment and a question. Um, so um, we're also coming up on our next five-year strategic plan. So this is very valuable information and very helpful. Uh, we, we had a whole process that uh, we enjoyed putting together a strategic plan, but it certainly doesn't fit on one page. And so this is very nice. And we also have included a lot of action steps, um, which made it a very clunky document to work with. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how you're going to add in your action steps and how might that be easily communicated? Sure. That's a really good question, Sharon, because you know you can do either way, right? It, it, it's kind of nice to have the action steps embedded right in the strategic plan, because then it's all in one thing, which is the advantage, but the disadvantage is it's all in one thing, right? So you end up with this like 12, 15, sometimes 20 page document, and you kind of hold it up in, in person and it's even heavy, right? And it, it gets even worse when it's electronic, trying to scroll through 20 pages of of stuff, right? So, so I, I think I, ideally, um, we'd like to keep ours on a one page like we have it. And then there's a backup document that has the action items on it. And that you can share with someone that's interested or internally, right, to, to, to keep you focused on what you're doing. Um, so I think that's one way to go is to really literally have two documents, one that's formatted nicely that you can, you know, share with everybody and volunteer everybody that wants to know about it. And another one internal that has all those action items. A um, little more work, but you've identified the problem with the heft of a, like having it all in one. I mean, I've handed that out before, right? The whole thing. And it, you give it to someone and they page through about three pages and then they put it down <laughs> on the table and you kind of wonder like, oh, I wonder if they're going to even open that again. <laughs> Understandably so, right? Yeah, we had tried just so other people know to have it all in an Excel document. And so we would continually update it or check things off when they had been done or continuing. And it was a great idea, but no, nobody's using it. It's just, it's not front and center. Um, and it's not being used as we had hoped. Hey, can I jump in with a question? This Absolutely. Is, uh, Katie Dunker, statewide coordinator in Colorado. Tim, we met a couple of years ago when I got to attend your statewide conference in Minnesota. Lucky me. Um, I, I love the way you guys are looking at revising your strategic plan and considering what are all the barriers to accessing our program, both as public or as a volunteer. So my question to you is two parts. One, can you speak a little bit about the name of our program statewide and how that can be acting as a barrier and what you guys are finding out in Minnesota about the term master gardener? And two, where do you see applications falling into that category as a barrier? Well, I think I'll start with uh application question, I'll do them in reverse order, right? The application question, um, it's interesting, Katie, that has, that came up in our, in our stakeholder interviews, you know, that our consultants doing. Um, there's been somewhat of, it, re, it really varies where you are in the state of Minnesota, whether you're in a more populated county or not. 
it's really different. So a county that is less populous that maybe has a group of say 20 volunteers, right? That, and the application goes out and pretty much everyone's accepted in the program, right? Fill out the application, you're in. We would like five more people, it would be wonderful. On the other end of the scale is perhaps a very populous county where the application goes out and they have a really elaborate process of interviewing and some people get in and some people don't get in and you know that's the other end of the scale right and um, we really need to take a close look at that the sometimes the application process values prior knowledge of horticulture above people who don't have prior knowledge of horticulture and that the more we discussed that one and the more we heard from our con the early stuff from our consultant right is that that's a barrier and it's a problem for if we're working on diversity equity and inclusion efforts then how can we say that you know someone can get in because they already know that doesn't feel i don't know it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't align right it doesn't match up so i think we're going to have to we're, that's going to have to be one of our action items or one of our perhaps even even a piece of our strategic plan is to really review what the application process looks like and what's the rubric what are we actually going to ask people um and i think i think our early thinking on it katie is that we it's certainly fair and and um and valid to ask people about their what's their volunteer commitment you know if we have a certain level of commitment for our program is that in alignment with the time and energy that someone has you know just to be fair right and it said expectations but beyond that uh, i don't know we need we need to take a look it's it's like it's like coming up as a barrier i'll put i'll say that right in that in that study it's emerging as a barrier to participation um, the same thing is happening um, with the name of our program um, it is emerging in that study as a potential barrier to both participation as a volunteer and participation as a community member in an activity that's sponsored by so it's emerging um, as as an identified barrier as part of that study and again i don't know what we'll do you know we're first we're gathering the barrier information right and then we'll decide on what are we going to do with this information for our program and, and make some recommendations um and then we'll go through the process that i'm sorry i already forgot the person from florida you just brought up about who was that sorry it was wendy wendy yes and wendy that's when the question that you asked comes in right we identify these barriers make some recommendations about what to do with them and then go through the folks that you were asking about like who else looks at these things right before you make these decisions this will go out through extension leadership and and share the results of the study through our consultant and what the recommendations are and we'll go through that process that'll be our, our the same process as the strategic planning so that's update katie is that, is that helpful yes hugely helpful it's great to to see what other people are wrestling with and that it's similar state to state, right? And that sometimes we just need to stop and think about that practical question that you're asking in Minnesota, which is, hey, what's the barrier to accessing our services and accessing our volunteer program? Um, it sounds like California, hey, no surprise here uh, that Marisa is working on um, and just finished a year and a half project focused on inclusive volunteer selection. So. This is where I think you know bringing our communities together and our states together and exploring these questions is super helpful, especially states like myself where we're pretty lean at the state level. So it's helpful to uh, to have thought partners across the U.S. Appreciate it, Tim. Yes, and that's a great point to take a look not only at our print materials and the language we're using, but the application process. So I really appreciate you bringing that up, Katie and Tim. Um, I do want to address some other comments and questions in the chat. Uh, Jennifer says that it looks like you've trademarked Let's Talk Plants. So she likes the change of language to engage people who may not have much of an interest in gardening. Can they get permission to use Let's Talk Plants? Oh, sure. Yeah, just uh, send an email. We're happy to help. 
Okay. The, the buttons are pretty fun. I, it, it's interesting that people will pick them up and put them right on their lapel, right? Like you want one of those? We didn't really expect that, but um, people like them. So there you go. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah, uh, of course. Thank you. As soon as I saw those buttons, I immediately thought of our local library because our local library does so many campaigns, like summer reading campaigns and just all these cool things. And I think it'd be neat to do something with the local library in regard to gardening and knowledge and talking plants and learning more. So that was a good point. Okay. Um, Marissa says, this is so impressive. She appreciates sharing how and why you re you revised your mission and vision statements and adjusted the language into your guiding principles. Um, Ask Master Gardener to Let's Talk Plants was a revelation and it sends an important message. While the university produces a lot of knowledge, it's important to respect the knowledge of the public. Your revision does this well. That's a really great point. Um, back to when Katie was talking about the term Master Gardener, in my, in my county and city here in Tampa, Florida, we have some local gardening folks who really consider themselves experts. And I think that they have a lot of issues with the term master gardener because they feel that it doesn't include their local knowledge and their experience. So that's an excellent point that we need to be aware of. Um, Leanne says, doing the work of guiding values and program priorities has allowed us to support and back up new directions in projects, especially for cultural connection and inclusive practices like celebrating pride this month. Um, and Julie says they have an old banner that says Ask AMG that is used at farmer's market booths, but they're gonna make a new one, um, probably something similar to the Let's Talk Plants. Um, again, that does make it more conversational and reduces the risks and just having a conversation and approaching people. Uh, I think everyone saw Marissa's working on the project for inclusive volunteering and uh, Chrissy just talked about that and Katie did too. Um, all right. And they've also revised their application position descriptions. That's another point of contact. You know, when we think about all these things that we use to describe our programs and engage people, these are all touch points, right? Um, position descriptions, interview guides and strategy documents. So these are all things that we could take a look at. Uh, great points. And some Katie is interested to know from Marissa more about the inclusive volunteer aspects. Maybe that's something that you could share on a future webinar. Um, I do want to say, Tim, uh, this presentation and the language that's used is just kind of always in the back of my mind. And today I gave a presentation just about integrated pest management. And I caught myself saying, you know, thinking about the terms your yard, your garden, and not using that specifically so that anybody on the call could understand and participate and gain a little bit more knowledge. So even from way back in 2018, I still think about this talk and the language red flags that we use. And I don't always get it right, but I think being aware of it is like the first step in trying to fix that. So I really appreciate you sharing all the work that you all have done, you and the entire team in Minnesota, Jackie, um, uh, Jackie, Delisha, I know you mentioned Diane, uh, Christy, uh, everyone has done a great job. These slides are available. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Tem or the team. Um, anything else that you all want to discuss or point out or anyone else working on a similar project or approach in your state or your county that you'd like to share? Tim, this is Jennifer Markey at uh, Washington State University. I took this statewide lead job um, in 2019, interim in 2018. And I just want to say that we have used much of what we have found on the UNM's website to um, establish our vision, mission, values. And if you take a look at our program priorities, they might look pretty similar to yours <laughs> and also have a very similar graphic. So uh, thank you so much for taking the lead on that and um, showing us, uh, being an example for the rest of us. I just wanted a quick say, <laughs> well, thanks Tim for his excellent leadership. Um, since taking over in his position. And when he actually came into his role, I was new in my role. That's been about six years almost. Um, but without his, his thinking and passion for what he does, um, I certainly don't think that we would be here and 
be able to help support uh, the changes that he's trying to make here in Minnesota. So I just wanted to say thanks to my awesome boss. Yes, and you guys are getting uh, like superstar kudos in the chat box because Colorado and Oregon are also using the tools that you've provided. So you're a state that we're modeling the work that we do after. And I, all of us, we just want to say thank you for doing such a great job of pushing us to do a better job in our states and our counties. Um, so thank you. So thanks for the for the kind words. And, and of course, I need to absolutely direct them back to everyone. You know, we're, we're working really hard. The Minnesota team is, is absolutely a team. And I know, I, know, I know that resources is somewhat unique, right? The extensions investment in the Minnesota team. And you just met Delisha and the, and the other folks that are here today. It is absolutely a team approach. And we're building, the only reason we can do what we do is we're building on how many years of work, right? From this, from the Master Gardener program, we're, we're building on amazing foundation, right? The foundation is here, it, it exists and it existed. So uh, full acknowledgement of that, uh, uh, standing strong upon that, upon that foundation. So kudos to everyone um, that, that on, on the call today, this is the, what a great program to, to work on. It's the public value and the impact is so, the potential is so big. Um, it's just exciting to, to work on it. Um, there's a lot of positive, positive um, public common good that collectively we can do. It's, uh, wow, I, I would say the sky's the limit. I don't know if that's right. Maybe that's a little hyperbolic. How about the, the top of the tree is the limit? I don't know, something like that, but so much, um, so much exciting work ahead of us, so. Yeah, I was thinking too just now, this could be an exercise to do with the Master Gardener volunteers. So, you know, Master Gardener volunteers help us write publications, they help edit and review um, brochures. And so, just as an exercise in a training class, you could ask folks to put together a brochure and then as a team take a look at the language that's being used. So, right out of the gate, they're aware of if we're inclusive and how we talk to folks and the terms that we use. Um, or, you know, work on a brochure together and see if it can be polished to the point that folks are happy with it and it is more inclusive. So there's lots of ways that this can be implemented in local and state programs. Um, so I think we've all got some homework to do, but I really appreciate Tim and your team sharing this information with us because it will, it sticks in your head and you think about those red flags. So thanks for being a leader. <laughs> Thanks for the invite and it's great, great to join today. You're welcome. So we'll, um, we'll send the recording out to everyone who attended today and even those who couldn't attend. Uh, I'll copy you on that. We'll also send out the presentation slides. I'll pull some information from the chat box because there were some links included that are very helpful. And if people have more questions, you could contact Tim. Uh, let me know if there's something that you'd like us to address in a future webinar, we can do that too. And I really appreciate everyone taking time out of your day today to tune into the discussion this month. So have a good rest of your week, everyone, and we'll see you next month. And thanks, thanks again, team and everyone in Minnesota. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.